Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial on Qualtrics brought to you by the Columbia Experimental Lab for Social Sciences otherwise known as CELLS. Uh, my name is Leo. I am the programming consultant at CELLS and this is my fourth semester there and this is my last semester as an undergraduate at Columbia. Now last semester I gave kind of a tutorial on Qualtrics and Amazon Mechanical Turk in person in the lab but for kind of obvious reasons, we're now online mostly, and so hopefully that wherever you are, this webinar slash tutorial can be of use. So today we're going to focus primarily on Qualtrics, um, but look out for, or feel free to reach out if you have questions and more information on Mechanical Turk or more detailed uses of Qualtrics. All right, so with that said, let's get started. So today we want to learn about Qualtrics, how to use it, how to get started, and kind of just get the basics in order to understand what we can do in Qualtrics, right? So there's uh, a lot to be done in Qualtrics, or that can be done in Qualtrics, and part of the, the hurdle, well there's two hurdles, right? It's one is, how do I use it, how do I get started, and two, I don't really know what it can be used for, right? So we're going to try to get past both of those in that you know how to get started, uh, get a survey working, and maybe even a small experiment, and also know kind of what to ask and whether or not Qualtrics is a good fit for whatever you're trying to do or whatever experiment you're trying to run. So let's start at the basics. What is Qualtrics, right? And so uh, at its core, Qualtrics is a survey tool, right? Um, and so they're used by a lot of marketing companies, etc. cetera, um, but it's getting more and more popular as a research tool, um, and I think you'll see pretty soon why, right? So it's way more powerful than what you might be thinking uh, of a survey tool in terms of something like SurveyMonkey or Google Forms because it's much more kind of interactive and dynamic. So you can customize just about everything. There's a lot of optionality, and you can even get kind of more involved in terms of kind of coding uh, a little bit that can get into Qualtrics, uh, referencing maybe what people said in an earlier question later on, uh, generating kind of data that they can interact with. So I think you'll see pretty quickly that it's it can be used for a lot more than a typical kind of regular survey. Um, and really that's the whole point, is that we're here to try and run experiments. So how can we use Qualtrics to run experiments? So to get started with Qualtrics, uh, a basic account is free. Uh, so that's a great way to start in terms of, okay, let me just see what it is outside of this video. Let me see how to use it, and let me see if kind of I can think about how I would use Qualtrics for my experiment, right? Because at the end of the day, if Qualtrics isn't useful for you, it's not worth going through it to get a kind of fully paid account. Um, so what a paid account does give you access to is a little bit more uh, optionality, a few more features. There's more question types. There's the ability to use JavaScript if you do get to that. Um, and you get a little bit more control over the aesthetics and overall survey. Um, so for sales affiliates, uh, you can request an account through ISERP. Uh, but also keep in mind that other groups have licenses, such as Columbia Business School. As you'll see, my account is still licensed under them, so you'll see their logo. Um, and so it's definitely possible to get an account if you know that this is what you need for your research and you want to conduct an experiment using Qualtrics. So like I said before, it's a survey tool at heart, right? And so when you just open it up, uh, and I'll do a demo soon, so you'll see kind of me use the tool and how to get there and all of that. Um, it is a survey tool. So when you just open it up, you're going to see questions and primarily you're thinking in terms of kind of question objects, right? So if your participant is playing a game, you have to think about that in terms of, okay, a question, a question, and then this happens, right? Um, now questions don't have to be multiple choice, as you kind of see here as the first default. They can be a lot more uh, than that. They can have images. They can not even ask the participant for something, right? You could just flash an image at them and then ask them about something. Right? They can just be descriptive text, they could be instructions, they could be pictures, um, all of that. 
So before we get started with a demo, let's just go over some basic vocabulary for using Qualtrics, right? So first you have the kind of bare bones question, right? And so this can be a text answer, a multiple choice. Um, they have slider questions. You'll see all tons of different types of questions that they have. And then you have questions which are usually part of a block, right? So you'll have a question block, which is usually a few questions. And you'll see why that's useful to kind of keep them organized or to kind of set up a path for your survey or experiment overall. And really controlling the organization of your experiment is going to be done in what you'll see is called the survey flow. And that's where you're going to kind of get to map out your experiment and really organize everything and kind of decide where the participant goes and what they see. So as I mentioned before, you have the ability to do a lot of different question types. As you'll see, this, this image on the left is taken directly from Qualtrics um, to give you an idea for how many question types there are. Right? So there's multiple choice, there's text entry, there's matrix tables, there's just text or graphics. Um, you can even come up with sliders and customize those sliders. So if you want your participants to tell you how strongly they feel about something, by dragging the temperature on a thermometer, that uh, optionality is available to you. And within this picture, as you'll see when I start using it, um, each of, or most of these at least, have the choice to have a, many different types. So, right, so within multiple choice, there's many different kinds. There's multiple answer, there's single answer. You can have them click on an image to select that as an answer choice as opposed to just a uh, drop down uh, or a list of choices. So you'll get to see some of that uh, today as well. And then there's more advanced options that are not as common for research surveys, but are there in case you need them. So that's something like a CAPTCHA to show that someone is actually a person. Uh, people can upload files. Uh, and you can have highlighting, which can be useful in terms of, you know, you want to highlight a, uh, a few words based on this information. So just to kind of give you an idea for what's out there, but the really, you know, we'll stick to text entry, multiple choice, and text and graphics uh, as we start. So let's take a look actually at how we use Qualtrics. All right, so when you just log in, you're going to be at a page like this, and this basically will tell you where all of your projects are. So as you know, when you just start, you're not going to have any projects, so let's create one. And that's, that was through the Create New Project button on the upper right of the screen, that dark blue button. So when we create a project, pretty much every project you create is going to be in the uh, kind of structure of a survey. So I'm just going to click on Survey right here. And then I'm going to give my project a name. Uh, let's call it you know, Demo Project. And let's click on the blue button to the right that says Get Started. And so once you've clicked Get Started, or once you've clicked the project that you want to work on, you're basically there, and you can see all of the questions that you've built. Right? So let's say, right, so they start us off with a multiple choice question. That makes sense. So let's say the first question that we want to ask is, do you agree to take our survey? Right? And so we can just edit the question right there. And then Qualtrics often even kind of guesses what you want to say. But let's say we want to edit the choices to just yes and no. And then we want to get rid of these. So we're going to go to the right. right? And here in this right toolbar is where you're going to see a lot of what you can kind of use to customize your survey and each individual question. So right here in choices, that's under the green multiple choice. Uh, I can click the minus sign to get rid of some of those choices, bring that down to two, and keep that kind of nice and clean, right? But before we ask them to take our survey, maybe we want to give them a consent information, right? That's pretty typical for most experiments that we conduct. So we're going to click create new question above. That's this plus sign right over to the right. And it creates another default multiple choice question. But I don't want this to be multiple choice. I just want this to be the consent information, right? The, the text that they read before they decide whether or not they want to take the survey. So I can go to this green bar over here that says multiple choice. And this is where I get to see all of the question types that there are, right? So 
these are all the ones that you saw before and I can scroll over them and I can click these little arrows to get options within the different kinds as I was talking about before. Uh, but for now, let's just stick to a text, uh, descriptive text, sorry. Let's stick to a descriptive text and that'll basically take out the question or the answer part of it and just let me write something, right? So this survey is an experiment done by Columbia researchers and will require about 10 minutes of your time, right? And so now that's what they're going to see. They're going to see that text. Then they're going to see, do you agree to take our survey, right? And for organization, right, we can name this block, right? So this block currently exists of two questions. And let's name this our consent block, right? Now, okay, now let's think about where is the user going to go after that, after the consent block. Maybe we want to, and I just created, uh, I clicked add block to create a new block. Maybe we want to send them to the instructions, right? So this will we'll name as the instructions block. And again, maybe we want to just add some descriptive text to give them the instructions. And something like this survey will ask you to guess a randomly generated number. And we'll see how to do that. Right? And so now we have kind of our consent block, our instructions, and basically we can just keep going from there, right? So I could add another block that is uh, maybe screening, right? So maybe I only want people of a certain age group or political affiliation, whatever it may be. I can add questions into here. So let's add a uh, multiple choice. Or well, let's let's try a different kind of question, right? So let's do a multiple choice from a drop-down list, right? And so this might say something like, "What is your age group?" Right? And now we can edit the choices here. And so maybe this is 18 to 45, uh, this is 46 to 65, and this is over 65. Right? And now they'll be able to choose from there, and that could be our first screening question. Uh, then maybe we want to ask about their political affiliation. So we create another question and we say, what is your political affiliation? And we want to Let's say Republican, Independent, Democrat, and other. Right? And so we can leave that there and just see how when I was typing and I clicked enter, that nicely kind of created another answer choice for me. If I accidentally create too many or I just want to change it later on, I can go again to the right where it says choices to the plus and minus and kind of uh, tinker with that and change any of that. And so now these are my three blocks. I can expand and collapse them uh, so that I can keep things organized. And what I mentioned before was the survey flow, right? Which is really where you're going to organize your project and map everything out. So if I click survey flow, now I can see the three things I've created. And so here I'll be able to add new elements, which we'll get into in a little bit. And I can move the blocks around if I want to decide that Oh, maybe the instructions should come from for the uh, consent, or maybe I want to screen before I even ask the instructions. So I can just keep moving those around. Um, I can add things in here, uh, as we'll see later. And then I can click Save or Cancel if I don't like the changes that I made. So I'll just click Cancel for now, so that we have it in the same consent, instructions, and screening order. Okay, so we spoke about question blocks, right, and why they might be useful. Hopefully you can see that they're a good way to kind of group your finer questions into more organized uh, kind of batches. And you'll also have features that are block specific, right? So within the survey flow, uh, it's much easier to work with blocks than it is individual questions. Uh, there are features that we'll see like timers, uh, which can apply to an entire block. So if you want to see how long they spend on the screening questions, we'll be able to see how long you know they spend taking they're on that entire page, right? Um, we can also duplicate 
entire blocks, which might be more efficient than duplicating questions. And it really just kind of lets us work with a larger element than each individual question. So the survey flow, which I just showed you a little bit about and how to change the order of blocks, lets you add a lot of different uh, elements. And so we're going to go into uh, several of these today, right? So the first one is, or well, you know, you could see the, the block, right? So right under what do you want to add, you can add a block. You can add a branch. That's for branch logic, right? So for example, if we only want uh, the youngest people that are taking our survey to proceed to maybe a, uh, the next question, we can do something like if they answered 18 to 45, then show them this. That's what a branch is, uh, and we'll get into that more. Uh, embedded data is kind of like variables that we can save, which are very useful. They can be something like what did they answer to a previous question. It could be a randomly generated number. Uh, we'll get into that as well. And randomizers, which let us randomize all the elements inside it. So that could be you know, maybe two different blocks. Maybe we have a treatment block and a control block. Um, but we could also randomize uh, different elements, right? So maybe we are assigning a variable that says treatment number, right? And maybe we have one, two, three, four. Then we could randomize the embedded data assignment of one, two, three, four. And I'll show you how to do that later. Um, and there's a few other kind of things you can look around with here, as well as adding an end of survey. Right? And so that's useful because, for example, if they read the consent and they hit no, I don't agree to take the survey, well, then maybe you want to send them to the end right away. Right? That makes sense. So you can add an end of survey block wherever you'd like. And so the survey flow is really good for organization, moving all this around, and kind of like I said, uh, just really mapping out the flow of your survey or experiment uh, in general. Right? So here is an example of, you know, okay, let's say I already have a lot of Republican respondents and I need more information on Democrats. So if I have a 15-minute experiment, maybe I don't want somebody who is a Republican to go through that 15 minutes and then maybe I have to pay them, but rather I just want to filter them out and get data only on the people that I need. So as I mentioned before, you can do that with what's called the branch logic. That's this blue element and an end of survey element, which is this red one. So if they selected Republican Party, then take them to the end, and they don't continue with the survey. And finally, here's the randomizer that I mentioned. Right. So uh, if I have two blocks, treatment and control, I put them both within the randomizer, which is this kind of pink object. And notice how it says randomly present one of the following elements. Right. And so that means that once my uh, respondent gets to the randomizer in the survey flow, they will see one of those at random. Uh, and I can click evenly present elements if I want to make sure that at the end of, let's say, I don't know, if I do 100 uh, respondents, that I get a 50-50 as opposed to just by chance, maybe 60-40 or something like that. All right, so now let's take a look at kind of what we can do with the survey flow. All right, so as I said before, maybe the first thing we want to do is make sure that only people who agree to take the survey are taking it. So let's implement that first. So we're going to go up to survey flow right here, and we want to add a branch logic. So we're going to add a new element, add a branch, and then add a condition. And so we're going to go to question, uh, do you agree to take our survey? And then if no is selected, right? So if this did not agree, then we want them to end the survey immediately, right? So we'll just do end of survey. And now I can move this entire branch up to right after the consent block, right? Because the user starts at the top of this flow and goes down, right? So if it's at the bottom, they won't get to that condition until they are kind of there in the path, right? And so now if they said no, they should go to the end of the survey immediately as opposed to seeing instructions or screening. Now, how do we just test to see if that's working? Well, we hit save in the bottom right. And then we can go to preview. And this lets us take our survey at any time, basically. So let's click preview. This is this blue button right in the upper right. And here's the first consent block that we made, right? This survey is an experiment done by Columbia researchers. That's what I just typed out at the beginning. And now here are our options. 
So if I click yes, it should take me to the instructions. If I click no, it should end the survey for me right away. So let's try no. Right, so we thank you for your time. That's the end. If I click restart survey in the upper left, I can try again. And if I click yes, I agree to take the survey, then it should take me to the instructions, right? Which was this survey will ask you to guess a randomly generated number and to the next block. And once I do that, I can go to the next block. Since there are no more blocks, now we get to the end kind of more naturally. And we can click close preview in the upper left to get back to what we were working on. All right, so now let's look at how we can maybe use a randomizer to show them different things depending on if they're in our treatment and control group. Right, so we can create a new block and call that block our treatment block. And another new block, which is our control block. And notice that right now they don't have any questions in it, so if they get to it, it'll just skip this block entirely. But we can still uh, adjust it from the survey flow even before we put in questions, right? So I don't want them to go to both treatment and control, but I want to randomly show them one. So I created an element randomizer, and then I drag these blocks into the randomizer, right? And so they're indented, so I know that they're within the randomizer, and anything that comes after won't have the indent, right? So if I screen them at the end of my survey, and I move this to the bottom, right? Notice that that one's not indented, which means it comes after the randomizer. And this, you just got to be careful to make sure that you're presenting the right number of things, right? So if I randomly present two of these elements, it will just give them both, but in a random order, which might be useful sometimes as well, if you want them to all take the same questions, but maybe in a different order. Uh, or if I just want them to go to one group, then I have to randomly present one, and I can click evenly present elements to make sure that I have a nice 50-50 spread at the end. So now that we have kind of an idea of how to make questions and put them in blocks and move those around, uh, maybe screen certain people in or out of our survey, um, or randomize parts of our survey, we can use embedded data, which is a really powerful way to kind of start changing the survey from a kind of typical survey that just asks questions, maybe with some neat functionality, but to more of an experiment, right? And so this can be anything in general, right? Embedded data could be just some text. It could be a number. Uh, it could be something you use to keep track of your uh, respondents, like a treatment number or a survey ID. Um, but it can also be something that's used within the survey itself, right? So notice before I said this survey is going to ask you to guess a randomly generated number. We're going to store that randomly generated number in a piece of embedded data. And then when we ask the participants to guess the number, compare their guess to that embedded data. If they got it right, present them with something that says you got, you know, you are correct. And if not, uh, we will say, sorry, you didn't get it, right? So let's see how we might go about doing that, right? So the embedded data fields are kind of these green elements within the survey flow, right? So if you see here in this picture, uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but at the top, there's a piece of embedded data called random ID. And then on the right side of that, after the equal sign, it says equals, and there's kind of some symbols. But basically, uh, you don't, you know, you don't have to memorize that pattern. That's how you would set a survey ID. That's a random number between maybe you know 10 million and 100 million. Uh, that'll be linked to that respondent's entry um, that you can use to kind of maybe map them to a certain uh, response, right? So if you're using Mechanical Turk. Right, you would use you would generate a survey ID here, and you would ask them to enter it on Mechanical Turk, right? And so now you know which worker on MTurk is assigned to the response on Qualtrics, because otherwise you would have no way of knowing who gave you which response. And another nice thing about embedded data is you can use it within your survey, right? So how once you create that survey ID, how do you show it? to the participant, well, at the end, you would have something like here, right? So if you look at this circle on the lower left of the screen that says field random ID, if you write that in the survey, then when the participant takes the survey, they'll see what's on the right, which is survey code, and they won't see that kind of ugly code. They'll see the actual number, right? And that'll be unique to their 
response. Uh, if you also want to reference something that they maybe answered earlier, you could use this kind of ugly code on the top where it says QID choice group selected choices, right, to maybe just reference something that they said before. So if they said, you know, I am a Democrat, uh, or they select a Democratic Party, then you could say, we hope that the Democratic Party does well. And if they had selected a Republican Party, it would show Republican Party. So the left side is what you see when you're making the survey. The right side is what the participant sees based on their entries. Um, and you'll see that if you click uh, Survey Preview and go through it. All right, so now let's take a look at how to actually use it in Qualtrics. All right, so if we're going to ask them to guess at a random number, then the first thing we should do is generate a random number. So if we go to Survey Flow and add a new element, we're going to select the green one, which is embedded data, and let's just call it number. Right For now, that's good. And let's set a random number. So we'll click Set a Value Now, and clicking these blue arrows you know, with Qualtrics, you kind of go down a path, right? So insert what's called piped text because it kind of goes down the pipeline. You might use it in later questions, etc. And we're going to do random number, integer, although it doesn't have to be, right? It could be a decimal. And let's say it's between 1 and 10, right? And insert that. And then it automatically kind of generates this kind of Qualtrics code that you don't need to know just to set a random number because it has a fairly nice user interface. But if you get familiar with it, if you're using Qualtrics a lot, um, knowing these patterns can be kind of useful. right? So now remember, though, that the survey flow is in order. And so if I want this to be generated at the beginning of the survey, I'd have to move it to the top. right? So let's move it up there. And now as soon as they start the survey, that piece of data is created and linked to their response. So if I click Save Flow, goes back to our editing, right? Let's say the treatment group, we actually just want to show them the number, right? So let's create a new question, and let's just make it descriptive text. And we want to say the number is, and then we want to present the number, right? Well, it's randomly generated for each uh, respondent, so we don't know. But we can click Pipe Text right above where I'm typing right now, and Embedded Data. Click this dropdown, and here's that data we just created called Number. Right? So we click Number and Insert. Again, there's some Qualtrics code. And so this is what we see. Right? Uh, the number is and that Qualtrics code. Right? They're going to see the actual number. So let's say maybe the control, uh, we want them to guess the number. Right? So create a new question, they have to input it in a text box, right, so text entry, and so we say please guess what the number is between 1 and 10. And so now based on the randomizer, we'll either see the number or we'll be asked to guess. All right, now before we actually test this out, just to see both of them and make sure we can see both of them. Let's take our treatment and control blocks outside of the randomizer and so that we get both of them, right? So I'm just going to move them outside of the randomizer, and if there's nothing in the randomizer, I can just delete it. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have it there, but why not reduce some clutter? So now if we preview the survey, we're going to see the consent block, the instructions, the treatment, which is going to show us the number, and the control block, which is going to ask us for a number. So let's see how that works. So here's our survey. Remember that we have to click yes in order to take it. This survey will ask you to guess a randomly generated number. The number is 1. right? And notice that we never typed 1 in, but we set a number to be randomly generated between 1 and 10. And then we said, whatever that number is, show it in this question. And then we said, please guess what the number is between 1 and 10. right? And so they could add a number here. And of course, every time that they answer a question, it'll be recorded with their entire entry. And I'll show you how to access that data later. 
Right? And again, we put the screening block at the end, so now they see this. Notice I can just click Next, but if we clicked, uh, we can customize that screening block if we want to make sure everyone answers that with what's called the with what's called a forced response question, right? So if I click on a question in this right toolbar, if I click forced response, that'll make the question mandatory just like in any other survey tool. All right, so now I want to go back to what I was doing with the random numbers and see how we can congratulate people that get the number correct, right? So let's add a block right after control that says congratulations and has a question that says you got the number correct, right? And I'll just leave it in a multiple choice for now. It doesn't hurt. So I want to only show that block if the number that they entered was the same as the randomly generated number. So first I'm just going to copy this kind of Qualtrics code for field number. That's the randomly generated 1 through 10 number we created. And you'll see why in a second. So when I go to the survey flow after control, if I want to create a branch, and if they input the number, so please guess the numbers between 1 and 10, that's the question, and then you kind of have to repeat it for the answer to that question. If it's equal to, and now I can just paste in that code that I copied before uh, that references the embedded data number I created, if it's equal to that, then show them congratulations. So I'm going to move congratulations into that branch logic, and if they didn't enter the number that was equal to, it's going to skip over that block and not congratulate them. So let's save that and see how that works. All right, so I saved and preview. So we agree to take the survey. The number is 5. And now if I type in 5 here, I should get a congratulations. So let's try that out. 5. And here's the congratulations block. You got the number correct. Now feel free to test out on your own uh, whether or not that if you entered anything other than 5, uh, they would not see that block. Because uh, uh, that's basically what the branch logic is doing, which is if that condition's met, they'll see that block. Otherwise, it just skips past what's ever in there. And now recall that we made this answer mandatory, which means that if anyone tries to skip this page at the end, they will be forced to answer it before moving on. All right, so once we've made a survey and we're kind of happy with it, um, you know, we might still edit it later, but we want to start getting actual responses uh, we have to know how to distribute our survey. And so the first thing we're going to do is click on the Publish button, that's the green one with the circle and the number 1, and after that it's going to generate a link which is unique to the survey and stays the same no matter what changes you make to the survey, uh, although you can manually edit the link if you want it to look a certain way. And then you're going to go to the Distributions tab, which is in the upper left and labeled with the number 2, and that'll give you access to your link. Right? So if you go there, you'll see something like this. Right? And so if you click on anonymous link, there you see in the middle of the screen a link that you can send to just about anyone um, or embed into a, for example, Mechanical Turk um, assignment, which lets anyone go to the survey and answer it. So if you're thinking about Mechanical Turk, right, you embed the survey link on Amazon's website. They click it, which brings them to Qualtrics. There, you've generated a random ID for them, and then they will enter that random ID back at Amazon's website so that you can link their worker ID to their response. If, in distributing, you want a few more options, you can do things like password protect your survey. So if you don't want anybody who has the link to be able to take it, that's an added layer of security. Uh, you can click prevent repeat responses, um, which basically per browser uh, if you know with cookies lets the lets them only take it once that's not a very secure way to do it but it kind of prevents people from accidentally taking it more than once or if they start it and close it and come back to it in the same browser they will pick up from where they left off so that's kind of nice and there's a few other options in there as well 
uh, which I'll show you in a second. Right, so let's say that we're happy with our survey, which asks people to randomly guess a number, and we'll click Publish in the upper right, and we'll click Publish again, and they actually give us the link right here, but anytime we want, we can go to the Distributions tab, click on Anonymous Link, and get that link back again. And if you want the link to maybe not say Columbia, for example, you could customize it to take that out of the URL. So you again get this nice layer of flexibility and optionality. So now once you've done that, you've created your survey, you've published it, and some people have taken it, well, you want to get access to your data, right? So Qualtrics kind of produces a nice kind of raw data file, which is, um, you know, I'd say fairly easy to use, um, as well as some other features, right? So that's in the data and analysis tab, uh, which is circled on the in the red circle on the left, right? So we, we're just in distributions, click the next tab over, data and analysis, and the main tool you're going to use is just export and import, which brings up this drop down and export data. And that's going to just create a CSV, or you can make it an Excel file if you prefer, but just to kind of see the raw data. Basically, this file is usually going to have a lot of columns, and it's going to have information on everything that happened in the survey. So when they started it, when they ended it, um, their IP address, all of the embedded data that we created, right? So the random number in this case will be saved, all of their answer choices, right? So whatever they guessed to be the random number, as well as kind of a bunch of other things, including survey order, text if you had a other option right other please specify that text will be there basically everything that happened in the survey will be in this file if you don't want the raw data which usually is what we're looking for you can go to reports which is kind of the last tab circled and left on the red and just download a pdf document which will try to summarize the data in you know maybe a cookie cutter useful way right so it'll usually show you what they saw um, and kind of try to make some graphs that Qualtrics thinks might be useful. If you have a very long survey, that's usually very kind of messy, right? You don't want 50 pages of PDF seeing what they saw. You just kind of want what they answered. But sometimes it could be useful, right? And so they're going to try to make uh, some guesses as to what uh, graphs are nice, right? So for example... Here is a graph based on, right, we asked what party, right? So it'll give you the breakdown of what party and kind of already do a few summary statistics. Um, so like I said before, it's not probably as useful as just getting the raw data if you have a large project, but it's there if you choose to use it. So let's take a look at how to actually get our data. We're going to go to the data and analysis tab right next to distributions. And once we're there, we're going to go to export and import. And although it does start to show you even here what the data that you generated is, right? So export and import, export data. Here's where you can choose how to download it. So I usually just use CSV, download all fields, choice text. And if you go to more options, you can choose to kind of change the delimiters, see maybe how some variables are coded. Um, and how you want to download it, but usually you just clicking download should be fine. Once you do that, we can open up the downloaded CSV. So once we do that, you can see here that this is kind of all of the data that was generated by our respondent, right? So we have the start date when they took it. Just a side note, note that Qualtrics, I believe, is based in... Utah and so their time zone is Denver and we have the end date and notice that the status shows you kind of who took it right so if you if it was you previewing your survey that's still going to be in your data but it's going to be labeled as survey preview so I always have a line of code that basically removes any rows where the status is survey preview now note too that if you take your survey from the actual link it's not going to recognize that as a survey preview. And so it's going to be, status is just going to be kind of the, the regular for a regular user. And you have to filter out your IP address in this column. So I wouldn't recommend taking it from an external link 
or maybe deleting those entries before you uh, distribute the survey with the link so you don't have to worry about that later. So this is going to give us everything like did they finish, how long did it take them, any answers, right? So this right here is did, did you agree to take our survey? And right, so the first time we tried no, and then everything else is blank, of course, because it wasn't shown. And every time we responded yes, any data that was created is going to be there. Guess uh, what the random number is between 1 and 10. That's going to be you know, 8 and 5 were the answers I put in. But notice at the end, right, under the column number, which was the name of the embedded data field that was storing our random number, is where the random number was put in, right? So the first time it was 1 and I guessed 8. The next time it was 5 and I guessed 5, right? And so those are going to match up. And then as well, anything else that they answered here is going to be there, right? So it's only blank when that question was skipped. Kind of getting towards the end, let's say you want to change how the survey looks. For example, I've had a lot of researchers that say I can't or I really don't want my survey to say Columbia Business School, right? Because for one reason or another, that could bias responses. Or maybe you just don't like the aesthetics of the default theme. You want to add things like progress bars, back buttons. Um, it really does let you change almost everything. The question is really just how to do it, right? And so the first thing we're going to do is go to look and feel. I'll show you where that is in a second. And that lets us make broad scale changes like themes, right? So typically, I'll show you later, I change the theme from kind of the default Columbia Business School, which is what my license is under, to the blank theme, and that removes the logo. So let's take a quick look at how to do that. So if I go back to the survey tab, And I go to look and feel, which is right under the survey tab. Then I can do things like change the look of the next button or the back button if that's important. I can add in a progress bar, right, uh, with or without text, right? So let's say with text, and that'll show me the percent complete. Here's the little preview, right? So there's 0% up to the left, 100% to the right. Um, but let's say I want to really change the entire theme get rid of the Columbia Business School logo, I would go to theme on the left menu, and I'd scroll down to blank, right? So notice there are some other options, if I just want blank, and then this is how it'll look. It'll get rid of the logo entirely, and I can see how it will look on a phone as well. All right, and if I click save, it'll make that actually happen. Another spot where you can customize some of those things as well is in survey options, like I uh, mentioned quickly before about back buttons. This is where you would do that, right? So here I could add a back button. That's the first thing at the top. And I can do things like password protection and prevent ballot box stuffing, which prevents people from taking it more than once, although it is just specific to your browser, so it's not that secure. And here there's a few other options that are pretty good as well. For back buttons, um, just recognize that it's not available across branches, uh, which is usually a good thing, right? So if you randomly assign someone to treatment and control uh, in a branch logic, then they can't go back and get reassigned. So that's, that's a good thing there, right? Whereas once they're in the treatment group and there's maybe a lot of questions and you want them to be able to go back, then they will have the option to use that back button. So finally, in case kind of you have a survey that or an experiment that uses a lot more data or a lot more fields than kind of what would be efficient to do manually, as I've shown, there are ways to kind of get past that, right? So one thing Qualtrics has is called Web Elements, which is essentially lets me pull data from another site, right? So if I know I'm going to be using, um, you know, a hundred different variables and I'm going to generate them at some point in the survey, right? I don't want to create a uh, hundred fields in those green embedded data elements in the survey flow. I can do that more efficiently um, by maybe, you know, pulling a JSON file from another website I have, which creates all of those fields, and then maybe I set them later. Um, if that sounds like nonsense to you, don't worry about it. You don't need to, but it's just showing that Qualtrics does have kind of a lot of 
um, extra functionality that isn't always so obvious, right? So then once I've done that, or even if I don't do that, I can just uh, I can use JavaScript throughout the survey as well, right? And so that can be convenient for one if you already know JavaScript and you don't want to worry about kind of learning the Qualtrics coding and embedded data formatting as much, although it is uh, you know, fairly straightforward, um, you can just jump right into the JavaScript, right? For most people, uh, they are fine using the Qualtrics interface, which is pretty friendly, and they don't know JavaScript. Um, it's not that bad, and there's a lot of Qualtrics forums that will give you code, right? So someone has asked before something like, oh, how do I change the background of one question, right, to red, right? And somebody will just post a snippet of JavaScript code, and you don't even have to know what it's doing. You can paste it into here and click the preview, check if it works, and then go from there, right? Um, but for example, if you're able to see on this slide, right, here is where I might do some randomization in JavaScript, right? So this we could also do in the survey flow, but maybe, you know, it gets more complicated than this. And here is where I just, uh, I get kind of a embedded data, right? So that's using the qualtrics.surveyengine.get embedded data command. And then I display a message which says with 50% probability, thank you for your time, or hi, you've been selected for a chance to win, right? So again, kind of, you can use Qualtrics in different ways. The basic user, inter user interface is great for most projects, um, is much easier to use, I would say, than JavaScript. But if you know that you need JavaScript or if you already know how to use it, it can be a pretty powerful extension as well. Um, JavaScript is one of those features, though, that is only usable on a paid account. Here is if you go to the Qualtrics kind of JavaScript API website, um, most of the commands that you're able to use, right? So add embedded data is the first one that's, that's frequently used, right? So that's basically if you're setting data that you're going to reference later on in your survey, you're going to do a add embedded data command and then reference it later using that kind of Qualtrics code to display it to your participant, right? You can also do things like hide the next and previous buttons. Um, you can get answer choices before. A lot of what you can do with the Qualtrics interface, but done uh, maybe on a different scale or in a different way that might be more convenient depending on the project that you're running. All right, so that's kind of most of the basics. That's how to get started with Qualtrics and hopefully uh, just kind of talking through some of those functionalities gave you an idea for what you might be able to do in Qualtrics um, because it's really kind of astounding that a survey tool um, can do kind of uh, an experiment, right? It's uh, if more and more researchers are coming to me, they show me something that they have in Otree or with MATLAB or Python, and I'm like, yeah, we can recreate this in Qualtrics, um, which is nice because it's also really easy to do online, right? Um, I can just post that link on another site, right? Maybe Mechanical Turk, maybe something else. I can get maybe hundreds of responses quite quickly, and that's really easy to do as opposed to something that might be local on your machine if it's written in Python or MATLAB. Um, some downsides of Qualtrics are that you're not going to get the ability to have users play games with each other. Um, so I've seen right, experiments like that where if you want your respondents' um, actions to depend on other people's actions, that's going to be really difficult to do in Qualtrics. Right? It's, it's more of the mindset of, Right? At the end of the day, it is a survey, so it's more of the mindset of you click start and you go through the survey flow. Um, but that being said, I have come across a lot of experiments that are able to be coded in Qualtrics. I hope you find it useful. Uh, feel free to reach out. So at the bottom there is my email, um, and the Wednesdays and Thursdays times are when I hold kind of office hours um, via Zoom now uh, for the lab, which you can find at the... Uh, website right there, which is the sales website. Uh, the Zoom links will be posted there in case they change. You can just keep going back to that link uh, and any information will be there. I um, hope you found this useful. Thanks.